Was that now we're time? recording. Any mistakes you make are now preserved forever. Oh, wonderful. On my hard drive. <laughs> I usually just preserve my mistakes on Twitter. <laughs> okay. Let's see. I'm going to turn up your volume just a scooch because it looked a little low. Okay. Um, welcome and welcome everybody who is joining us now. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so uh, my name is Ben. Um, I, people know me from the chat, uh, my non-scientific takes as nascent novice. Um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about uh, vampires, because um, I've self-appointed myself knowledgeable on that topic area. And like most things, I'd like to push you as far as possible into making plausible the completely unscientific realm of vampires. <laughs> And I feel like you're kind of a soft touch, so I should be able to get you too. <laughs> I'm a soft touch. That's fair. I agree to all of the nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. I yeah, sure. I'll 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 admit to being a soft touch. That's a that's a good way to put it. When I'm... it comes to going down rabbit holes of non scientific plausibility, <laughs> I feel like you're very open minded. I do love a rabbit hole, which I forgot I didn't have time to make I'm actually going to make a rabbit hole button that I can press. <laughs> That will keep a counter in case it happens. Like a, so, not, it's just, so it's just an automatic ticker that'll just keep rolling it. Not all automatic, time. but oh, I see. Yeah, mm -hmm. funny. No, no, no. I will control it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, cheers, David. Welcome. Hello, um, David and Manigard. And others. There's a always a larger proportion of non non chatters, which is totally fine. Oh, and a new follower, um, Samuel Animates. Thank you, and welcome. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, just to clarify, you didn't hear that, right? You were just seeing the blinking lights. Yes, I'm just seeing okay. stuff. I'm not hearing stuff. Okay, great, 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 great. All right, so uh, my face is there. <laughs> But what are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about vampires, which I totally I I've been saying this as I as the for the before the lead up to this, that I feel like certain fantasy elements drift so close and into what I consider sci fi that, you know, it's it's in the same family. I know in like, you know, sometimes a smaller bookstore will have sci fi and fantasy. There's definitely like very sci fi and very fantasy but I'm amenable to that 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 middle zone. I think, you know, vampires definitely fall within that. There are definitely separate literary traditions, to, but to pretend that they don't have significant overlap is a little silly. Yeah. And I think in terms of, I mean, this sort of one of the very first of these streams was about um, Stargate Atlantis. And if those are not vampires, I don't know what vampires are. Yeah, that's true. The Wraith. The Wraith are space vampires. Absolutely. They're older than vampires. If they take like if they're basically taking like life essence, that was what vampires were long before they got around to blood. Yeah, it's a little bit more direct. Yeah, that's that's the thing too. Um, not not unlike other uh, fantasy elements, uh, like like, but um, what am I trying to say? I feel like the roots of where vampires come from, as we might may or may not get to, is in potentially real disease something real that people were seeing and in various cultures made different uh assumptions about made different conclusions too about what was going on uh which maybe we should mention outright we're kind of taking the like how far east into europe are we going for the where's the vampire cutoff because we are taking a very european look at vampires Although certainly vampire-like entities show up in all sorts of cultures all over the world. But we're being very colonial in our disregard for that. But I think it's because in our Western culture, it's just what we're most used to. Yes, I think I would say we're certainly being very Eurocentric, or at least I will be today, because that's the information that I know about. Um, and so I would argue maybe that I'm being anti-colonial and that I'm not trying to equate universality to what is very specifically Western European interpretation of vampire folklore. And That's so, true. 
Yeah. So, specific, yeah. So in terms of like, I know that there are rather similar folklore in sort of Southeast Asia and sort of Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but I'm just choosing to admit that I don't know enough about that to really say anything of interest or authority. And so I am firmly planting my flag in. We are going with the very, very first accounting and the first thing that we're going to think about as um, sort of a panic that was happening when the Austrian Empire took over northern Serbia in the 1730s. <laughs> and I'm just disregarding everything that happened before, and I'm just starting there. So that's that's where I'm starting. So the year is 1730s. <laughs> yeah. Gather around everyone who came to hear about science. I'd like to talk to you about both history and literature exclusively. <laughs> well, well, I'm here, so I can talk right. about not those things. <laughs> Yeah, but that's definitely where I, where my brain is coming from, specifically dealing with sort of more of the history of vampire literature in English specifically, um, so we can sort of largely disregard everything else and keep them to people who are far more knowledgeable about those things. Yeah, cool. Um, so David says, so a vampire can suck blood, a zombie can eat brains, but what about contagion? Like the movie Contagion? That's that's a virus. That's that's the that's kind of the vampire of the molecular world yeah there is definitely an overlap in particular when we get into sort of the 1950s and 60s where because sci-fi had sort of entered um you get these more medical vampires which for me at least are pretty indistinguishable from zombies and so um sort of the the usual one that people bring up with that would be um i am legend which yeah. like is that the vampire is that a zombie it's it's pretty much both but yeah, there are some medical models around vampires as well, um, which would be well within sort of the realm of the other portion that we're not going to be tackling this evening, which is we are, I am specifically moving away from the, uh, he is a, he's Superman defense of basically everything where vampires are made by magic. So we could probably just wrap this bad boy up. <laughs> we're sort of going to hopefully be digging a little deeper into it and not just saying, well, how does it do that? It's Superman. Move on. Yeah, we're gonna be digging in, I think, a little bit. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, uh, these are generally with guests pretty free float form. So, where do you want to start? Yeah. So, um, just as a general note, naturally, as you might imagine, just for people who are either listening or watching live, or sort of maybe watching the vod later. Um, we are going to be talking about blood a lot this evening, and so if that is a content that you're really not comfortable with, um, maybe just look at your screen um, when the slide that has some platelets, I think, on it are up is probably where we'll be mostly talking about that. Um, if that's not up, then we probably moved on to other topics, so it'd be good for you to jump back in. But We can use that as like a warning. If we move into the blood territory, we can just move to that slide. <laughs> Yes, we'll just have her have her up, and it's it's like a textbook image. So I think it's probably the least challenging of of images of blood, other than like a cookie and an apple juice, I guess. But yeah, yeah. So in terms of where I think of sort of where literature about vampires sort of begins in sort of the English speaking world, um, is that um, a lot of this happened specifically because of uh, a book that was sort of written with the very, very snappy title of The Travels of Three English Gentlemen from Venice to Hamburg being the Grand Tour of Germany in the year 1734. <laughs> this is a book that the um, OED frequently references as the first mentions of vampires in English. Um, however, this, because why not be as pedantic as possible and argue with the Oxford English Dictionary has two problems that I've identified. Uh, the first being the account in which someone very clearly in 1679 describes what is a vampire without actually using the word. And then another account in um, 1688 in which the word vampire is used as a metaphor. Um, they're talking about bankers and calling them vampires of the public, the riflers of the kingdom. And so if you're using a metaphor in your language, typically that's because you imagine that your audience will understand what you're doing. And so that to me means vampire was known, at least by literary circles at, at that point. Yeah. Do you think it was um, like, I mean, I don't know, but there's that thing where um, we apparently don't know the original word for bear because bear just means brown because no one said the word out loud. Mm -hmm. They didn't like to. So everyone just forgot it. Do you think it's like a, if you say vampire, you you attract them? Uh, yeah, maybe. I think um, 
No, that's interesting because I know that sort of in etymology in general, um, it's fascinating to think about sort of where things are, where words start. Um, there's so there's a really great journal that I like to read. It's called the Journal of the History of Ideas. Um, and in this, they have sort of the idea of vampire as a word. And um, Dr. Katharina Wilson puts forward the idea that vampire could theoretically come from four different languages. Oh, as it was brought over um, into English. But it seems like the one that looked like it had the most reality or sort of consensus was there is a Serbian word that sounds like vampire, obviously spelt with Cyrillic letters, but it just it's pronounced vampire. Is that one um, of the words we're seeing on screen? Uh, yeah, yeah. so that would be its transliterate. So it's written in a Cyrillic alphabet, so it's a different text than you're seeing. But like vampire with a Y is basically what it's made into English. Ah. And so like that's and that's how it's used in that snappily phrased 1734 book that I was talking about. So I think that that sort of uh, what that sort of makes the most sense to me. And that's where sort of I was delightfully um, taught that the word in Romanian so the homeland of Transylvania is a uh, neologism. So like they would have translated it from English vampire. So the word in Romanian comes directly from English, hmm. which is more, more fun to me. Yeah. Huh. Also because Transylvania is actually a very specific reference in Bram Stoker's Dracula. It's not necessarily like the birthplace of Eastern European vampire folklore. So that's sort of where I would... From my sort of literary perspective, that's where I would maybe start with what is the vampire that we sort of know as now from a reading it in English standpoint. Um, I, for me, I would maybe start with something like widespread knowledge of uh, Penny Dreadfuls, which were sort of pamphlets um, in Victorian London. Um, that were sent around. One of them was called Varney the Vampire, um, or even more delightfully, it was sometimes called Feast of Blood. <laughs> um, that ran for three years in uh, the 1840s. Um, and there were several um, sort of books and stuff written about vampires beforehand, but this was one that because it was a very cheap pamphlet and it was produced for so long, it would have probably made this specific version of the vampire most accessible to people. Mm. Um, and that sort of is backed up by the fact that this is where um, we sort of have someone uh, who needs to be out at night. This is a vampire that has fangs that leave specifically to puncture wounds. Um, they sort of have superhuman strength. Varney can hypnotize. Sort of all of the things that we would think about as vampires sort of originate here. Um, and then, of course, with uh, sort of Dracula um, in 1897 with Bram Stoker. At that point, we have somebody who's from Transylvania, has a cape, um, is yeah. bringing uh, we have vampire hunters at that point all of those are sort of between the two we start to get a, a general sense and then from there we start to see people playing with those tropes so then this is just the like literary evolution or, or appearance of vampires but maybe these bits and pieces like came from regional stories and stuff like that but that's probably unclear right yeah, so in that um, 1730s uh, sort of book, it is the first descriptions that we have in English as to sort of localized northern Serbian myth. Yeah. Um, however, there would have been a, a larger diffusion of revenant or other sort of succubus, incubi legends that sort of get all rolled up and wrapped together. Um, and so a lot of those, a lot of the things that we'll sort of be talking about in terms of scientific plausibility are things that come from older maybe more realistic background that were then attached to this specific literary monster later. yeah hmm. yeah so that's sort of the, the the beginnings of it in english and where we start to see some of the most specific uh, traits that we'll be talking about cool um i just want to make sure that i'm on the right slide yeah do you want to be on this one <laughs> um it's ha it starts with <laughs> sir francis varney and yeah, ends so in nandor the relentless yeah so this would be sort of a list of just sort of me thinking about like what where sort of vampires were going and yeah. so um obviously as we sort of move through sort of the introduction of things like film and movies um we can start talking about those as well but by the time we get to sort of Barnabas Collins and uh, sort of halfway through there, we're basically well into what I think most people assume when they think of vampires. But 
that would be a great place to ask sort of you when you think about vampires where do where does that knowledge come from for you or what do you think you're most sort of uh aware of when oh, it comes to vampires? like like where my yeah information of vampires from came from yeah. uh i think i actually know the actual the real answer <laughs> because um, I remember as a child loving this particular movie about vampires who drank tomato juice. <laughs> and I have not seen this movie in literal. In, I mean, in how old am I? I've probably not seen it for like 25 years. But I guarantee that all of those tropes filtered their way into the vamp this this movie. And I learned about them just without the blood. So what is that? Turn into bats, drink tomato juice in air quotes uh they have the fangs lived in castles it was i think it was a very like gothic sort of aesthetic that they also had which is not really a trait of vampires except that that you know that's what i think of like that uh possibly fake sort of dress that they have um and sort of uh just styling uh of the the uh stereotypical vampire i, I don't know how else to describe it um, yeah no there's a, there's a definite look that I, I think most people associate with vampires and it's probably not too unlike count von count from sesame Street. yeah no that yeah exactly you're right um i i do know like there were things that i was missing so like i didn't learn until very late uh in 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 my life so far that you know in bram stoker's dracula he could become a wolf and mist i didn't know that those were uh, and it wasn't just that story i think associations with wolves is a longer thing or at least pops up other places i never knew that yeah that definitely so a couple things there so that definitely the shape-shifting aspect of it is something that attaches it to some of the earlier folklore vampires are not the only nighttime creatures that can sort of transform into creatures of the night your owls your wolves your toads your rats your bats or fog of course <laughs> and so uh that actually is interesting and brings up one of the questions that from um cliff alistair mclean um talking about what is the connection between real vampires so the blood-sucking bats and vampires from eastern european stories um one of the cool things that i found out in the sort of uh, OED investigation of the word is that um, much like cardinals and I think capuchin monkeys be because they're sort of uh, from the Americas they're named in English after things that came before them so the vampire bat it, when it was discovered in English it's called the vampire bat because of vampire folklore not the other way around mm. and so they found an animal that sucked people's blood and went oh I guess it's a vampire <laughs> well, and so it's sort of talking in reverse but we'll talk about that a little bit more just wanted to let um just wanted to let cliff know that we were going to get to that a little bit more um when we talk about blood but that is definitely there is a significant connection but i think it works in reverse of what you would normally think yeah because I, I i did try to look up before getting into a rabbit hole because we are going to talk about that <laughs> later uh a bat hole today a bat hole a bat cave um uh i did try and look up like because i did know that vampire bats were not native to europe uh what blood consuming animals are in europe there aren't any specifically i mean yeah certainly any carnivore loves the taste of blood but not like yeah i only like that blood anyways yeah there are three different types of vampire bats just in case anybody was oh wait i didn't know that did i did i get something wrong is there one in europe Oh, no, there's just three different species in America. Oh, in the yeah. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and as far as your cloak, I wonder what one that is, because I think I know of a book that's called, literally just called Vampires Who Drink Tomato Juice, but it's like a collection of jokes and essays and stuff. But um, so I wonder where, what movie that is that you're talking about. Um, I'll, I'll but look I, it do, up. I do know that the sort of way in which we think about their dress largely comes from some very specific 20s adaptations of Bram Stoker's Dracula um, put on by Hamilton Dean. Um, and that was also why um, the sort of 1931, I want to say, film Dracula has uh, Bela Lugosi looking and speaking like he does. And that's mm -hmm. sort of where we 
get from there. Oh. I don't know if you can see this. <laughs> I found a poster for it. Narrated by Elvira, Mistress, Mistress of the Dark. <laughs> that explains oh, some great. things in my life. Yeah. Okay. Well, icon. So that works. Anyways. Vampires. Um, and David, you I mean, make... I would trust that she's authoritative. So yeah, <laughs> should have gotten her on too. Uh, David, we will definitely be talking about. At least I want to talk about rabies later on. <laughs> yeah, the sort of medical model for where, because like in most anthropology, like where did this come from? The medical model, ra rabies has a very large part to play in that. Yeah. Okay. Cliff brings up a good point that bed bugs live all over the world and they suck blood and can leave that's, the hole. That's true. So, well, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think. Like, humans, we categorize insects often, I think, kind of differently in terms of, like, stories and things. They're like swarms and pests and pestilence. They're not a discrete figure whose, like, intentions and actions you, like, you know, think of. Um, not that yeah, that, that, that not that that can't be part of it. It's just like I feel like it's human nature to kind of ignore the fact that a, like an insect is doing something in place of like if a larger animal was doing something. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so we were talking. You you were um, talking about Lord Varney a little bit. I do feel like we at least have to get to. Bram Stoker. I mean the the like nexus of like vampiric stories in the like zeitgeist. Can it be a zeitgeist if it's since the eighteen hundreds? Yeah, I, it's still certainly like a brand that works, yeah. and people are still make, and it is still front and center. If you're thinking about a vampire in culture, it's probably Bram Stoker's Dracula at this point. Um, but yeah, so that came out in 1897, um, and basically this has, you know, naturally become our sort of definitive vampire story in English. So most people have a, a pretty strong working understanding of it, um, but if you do not, I would encourage you to look at any of the dozens of uh, portrayals of the book, or just um, the, the, I think the 1990s uh, Francis Ford Coppola movie is the most true adaptation i think there's a couple things have changed in there but most of the like very very bizarre weird choices of that film are because they're from the book so mm -hmm. um yeah this they're sort of the one thing that i think it was sort of interested in the research about this is that there is some scholarly debate as to whether or not stoker had in mind count dracula as being based off of the historical character of vlad dracula um, I know it sounds sort of silly because they have the same name, um, but Dracula itself as a name for vampires or associating them specifically with Eastern European sort of like aristocrats or like landed folks is not necessarily specific to that historical character. And there's really no indication that Stoker would have had any knowledge of this person. I see. Um, he was not a very well-known character at the time. And so there seems to be a sort of interesting parallel communication where, you know, historical figures from Eastern Europe were being exoticized by uh, sort of English and American authors. And once this individual Vlad was found, they were sort of slammed together into the Count Dracula character hmm. after the book was released. I see. Um, so like they, the, the character, the, like, okay. Like if someone today never saw, never read like Lord of the Rings, but then went off and wrote a fantasy story about a journey, magical items, maybe a night or two, you can't deny that it was completely because if you trace back far enough, Lord of the Rings, right? So there were yeah, maybe you would have to, stories you, like that all maybe originated by or were in part influenced by the story of this real person. Mm -hmm. But Or another good one would be like, so wargs w-a-r-g-s yeah are things in lord of the rings they're also things in game of thrones they're also scandinavian myth hmm. 
hmm. and all three of those things are presented slightly differently. Yeah. And so, but they're all called works. So works. did one come from one or did they all come from a general understanding or were they, is that same word used for sentient wolves and people who communicate with wolves? Yes, you can use them either way. And so the concept of like the Dracula and him, like Bram Stoker specifically using this individual as reference doesn't necessarily work for i mean the largest one is that he wasn't from transylvania so <laughs> the, like the historical character's castle wasn't anywhere near where count dracula's castle is supposed to have been so yeah. um it's interesting that the sort of namesake of the most popular vampire they may just have been two dudes named dracula <laughs> one of whom was real and one of whom was made up in someone's mind Huh. Which I kind of quite like. A lot. Wow, yeah. that's gonna be like uh, like an um actually fact now that I'm gonna bring up every time Dracula and Vlad Dracula uh, comes up. Yeah, it's I yeah it's it's the more interesting note there. But um, this specifically um, this understanding of um, a vampire as a sort of literary character as opposed to like a fork folkloric monster also sort of um is really ramped up here in this yeah. one um it's something that we see in varney as well um and in a lot of sort of current vampire sort of literature and movies but um this is where we start seeing them as individualized motive-based characters and not more like um a boogeyman that comes in your window at night kind of thing do you happen to know because cliff is asking um does dracula mean little dragon or son of the dragon it's something about a dragon for sure. That's all I remember too, is it has something to do with another mythical creature. Yeah. Um let's go to our authority here. Elvira's personal website. <laughs> Elvira's personal website, yes. I'm i I'm texting her now. <laughs> um Yeah. This is not giving a translation. Miriam doesn't have I need OED. Come on. Good old OED. Good old OED. Um, so in Romanian, it now means the devil. And um, But it is derived originally in both Romanian and English from Draco, which is just dragon itself. Just so, dragon. All right. In Latin. But... Yeah, in English, though, because Dracul is the family name, so I would, I, this is speculation, but Dracul is the family name, so if it's Draculia, it seems diminutive, and so I could imagine it being child of or son of yeah. hmm. Dracula, Dracul, so like that makes sense to me. I would maybe say it's probably son of the dragon, but someone would need to research that more than I just did. A cursory Google? Yeah. Yeah, so that's sort of where those those pieces start. Um, and bizarrely, um, mo we have basically everything there except for one of the things that I think um, uh, is most thought about that is not present yet. And that doesn't come until we get to um, a, a story called um, Count Orlock, um, which is a stand-in for Dracula in the horror film Nosferatu from oh, 1922. Yeah. Um, that is the first time in which it becomes very clear that it is not that the vampire is weakened by sunlight or can't use its sort of vampire powers and when it's, the sun's out. Um, Count Orlock in Nosferatu is the first time in which your vampire is killed by sunlight, um, which becomes obviously a plot point for a lot of other stories in which um, it's no longer a, a hindrance to a vampire. It's a sort of mortal danger to a vampire. Mm. So by the time we get to Most Fraught 2, 1922, we basically have all the pieces in place. Um, but it was an interesting to me that it wasn't until then that we really have this specific, which I think is, like, fundamental to vampires. Yeah, that seems, like, pretty... Yeah. That's that's interesting that it came up so late. Um, and Cliff, Cliff says, Orlock is also a metaphor for the plague. Yes, exactly. So that um, that in that movie, um, there are 
a couple different things that Count Orlock is doing in there. I think it would be remiss for us to not state that there are some very obvious and quite distasteful um, sort of anti-Semitic tropes mm. being used in this movie, um, especially with Count Orlock. And so like that is absolutely part and parcel of some of the um, uh, information that is being portrayed in that movie. Um, but yeah, it is also a, a time in which sort of Eastern menace as a disease situation um, is being explored, um, not for the first time, um, because a lot of early vampire folklore dealt with them bringing disease as well. I, uh, em embarrassingly, I don't really know since it's been out for so long. Oh, 100 years. Um, I have not seen uh, Nosferatu. The only German expressionist film that I have seen is The Somnambulist. Yeah. Which actually is, I think, very similar in a lot of ways, except it's not a vampire. Yeah, there's a lot about that movie that's interesting in particular as like a piece of art. Um, so, well, yeah, like of German sort of expressionist horror. But um, if you're looking for sort of the story itself, um, Werner Herzog did a version of it in the 70s. I think it's called Nosferatu the Vampire. Mm. Um, very, very interesting. Okay, cool. And it sort of still has, unfortunately, some, but it's not as quite obvious and like intentional anti-Semitic tropes in it. And it has a quite interesting message about. Uh, it's it's more of a political message about how you have this vampire that provides no service to the community, and <laughs> uh, just sucks off the work of the peasants. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. That's interesting, huh? Yeah. Yeah, in that movie, Jonathan Harker is turned into a vampire, and so it's a metaphor for how sort of the middle class sort of work their way up to the bourgeoisie and stop being useful to anybody. Hmm. Interesting. That's the Batcave for... Yeah, okay. Wow, I, I didn't even know there was there was a Werner Herzog Nosferatu movie. I am probably going to seek that out. I think it's a frequent... Uh, Werner Herzog muse Klaus Kinski too, and that's always a party. So, <laughs> Herzog, there we go. Oh yeah, David confirms. Ah, cool. And Altmus Frizzle Lestat, yeah. Interview with a Vampire is sort of um, one of the other sort of I would probably call like the modern fundamental like adds to the lore. There are obviously things like um, sort of twilight and that kind of thing but um, you know for whatever reason there are probably a few that we don't need to get into that it, it hasn't really caught on it adds i think it adds like a sort of vampiric venom or something that that does a lot of stuff but i don't know that that's really taken on as much as things like interview with a vampire sort of really popularized the idea of siring the vampire instead of like a vampire goes and just eats a person yeah um interview with a vampire is the first time that really discussed what would it mean if a vampire turned someone into another vampire hmm. so yeah i think that's sort of uh i had a very extensive uh sort of literary history but i don't know that it's as interesting as maybe digging into some of the traits because we can always bounce back in when absolutely they're, they're relevant. uh not but, that it's not interesting but it's like where you're getting into the time where the number of vampire properties begins to skyrocket yes. and and the one thing i do want to comment about just in terms of like my worry originally for this conversation was like, okay, how can we talk about a discrete <laughs> set of like traits, uh, literary or biological themes or whatever. And then in sort of looking around and reminding myself the, the vampires in even recent just media, literature and art, it still kind of stays in its lane. Like, okay, you get the, yeah, you get the vampire venom, you get the uh, twilight sparkles, but beyond stuff like that every once in a while, it's like very self-contained. Um, and I don't know why that's like, yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, it sort of depends in terms, it still certainly is part of the cultural conversation for sure. Um, and I think that people are more, seem a little, or artists seem a little more open to messing with it a little bit. I was thinking when I thought about um, in the last like 25 years, like the subgenre, like if you would take like vampires as a genre instead of like horror as a genre, for example, and tried to do like subgenres, like there's actually a shocking amount of things that vampires seem to slide their way into in terms of like 
I thought about like paranormal romance, like straight up erotica, <laughs> detective stories because they're all out at night, uh, yeah. comedies, um, black exploitation movies. Um, yeah. There's a, like there's all there's quite a lot like YA novel. Like there's quite a lot going on. Definitely. Um, also, I just acknowledge the chat pointing out even further more vampire things that I don't even think are listed on on what we're looking at. Uh, yeah, they're everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. Yes. I, I mean, did clearly... not get into video games, but Skyrim, it's it's mechanical. Like, there's, they're all over the place. So they clearly have cultural resonance. <laughs> I, I would imagine that point has been made. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious. Everyone really like, if not likes vampires, is just okay with interacting with the idea of a vampire. I like mean, it's, all good folklore. It clearly has some deep, deep seed in our sort of shared historical past. Yeah, it's it's kind of. I feel like it's just partially because, um, uh, what am I trying to say? It's like it's fun to fear the idea of a of an intruder of the night who's going to like, you know, come and get you. But at the same time, it's kind of attracted to be like, oh, well, if I was a vampire, I get to be, and this is part of some of the stereotypes that have lingered in like the modern era is like, oh, young forever, beautiful, vul invulnerable. And the only thing you have to do is drink people's blood. People love having power over others. It doesn't seem like a bad thing, right? But people don't want to be zombies potentially a very similar set of things uh -huh. minus the looks and personality yeah well that is one thing that i mean i think that uh, you know i think unfortunately twilight gets placed unfairly that they try to treat it as something romantic whereas vampires weren't before nonsense yeah because i mean try like way pr one of the very first pieces of literature that i could find at all after barney the vampire is um, an explicit lesbian erotica called Carmilla. Oh. And it's from the 1870s, and they're very clear about what vampires are. So, like, <laughs> I think that <laughs> the idea of a supernatural or sort of god, like, semi god like figure choosing you specifically um, is really played up in the um, Anne Rice novels in particular. And I think that that's where a lot of the as oh, Miss Frizzle is so delightfully putting it, um, vampires are hot phase. <laughs> yeah. The, the sort of uh, interesting... <laughs> you are humanity. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's where uh, I think a lot of this goes to. <laughs> oh, yeah. I encourage it, Alt Miss Frizzle. I really do. Carmilla. Say that again. What is it? It's called Carmilla. C-A-R-M-I-L-L-A, -L -L -A, I think. And it's... I think it's... I want to say 1870s. Okay. I will double check. But. Here, I will. Uh, oh, nope. That is about the antagonist yeah. from Castlevania. I say I say nothing about the quality of the I assume movie adaptations as that's not my milieu, but I would encourage everyone <laughs> to, to look at the literature. <laughs> um, I am going to just link the Goodreads page for Carmilla. That is what I will do. And I mean, if anybody, if anybody's in the mood, to, I think tomorrow there's a um, movie called The Invitation that is being released, and that's about vampires. So, The Invitation. Got, you got new stuff coming out soon. Yeah, I feel like no, I have heard of that. That's why that sounds familiar. So Altmus Frizzle asks, "Is Carmilla from Castlevania based on her?" I am almost assured the name is a reference but i haven't actually read or watched it so i couldn't tell you if the character is the same but the name is an absolute reference cool yeah so you want to dig into some science let's do it or science in air quotes we'll see i mean this is hard science what are you talking about hard hard science it's yeah hard well, for me well what do you want to <laughs> hey uh, well, what, yeah, what do you want to talk about first? I mean, there's so many little things like in, in, in vampires that we can kind of tease apart. I, I Well, actually, I do have a suggestion of where to start. Sure. I don't actually know if we have a specific slide about it. Your um, stream, your rules. 
my stream, my rules, my rules are there are no rules. Um, let's just, let's, I'm, I'm going to stay on this uh, because the thing that I wanted to mention is potentially the origin of, of vampires or not the origin of vampires, but you know, the, 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 the like thing that is stuck in our cultural brain or something where humans have always been repulsed and set and uh, repulsed and interested in the process of death, uh, decomposition, the, 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 the fact that we don't know what happens after we die, um, or at least some people, uh, that is some people's view. Um, and the thing is that even though we are, you know, biologically tuned to like fear dead bodies, mm -hmm. we also have evolved in such a way that we mourn our dead and keep our dead relatively nearby and we know where our dead are. So we interact with, with corpses in ways that other animals just don't. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's this sort of idea that some of the traits of of the vampire and I don't know how much of this is true because this is, this is where it gets tough, where um, there are accounts of vampires stemming from um, and I don't have a citation for this. Um, I don't remember where I read this or heard this, but uh, unsurprisingly stemming from times of plague, either. Um, not the plague, but um, outbreaks of things like tuberculosis um, or, or when rabies, a disease that has been with us since like 2000 BC, um, it's kind of crazy. We know very more, not precisely, but precisely for, for evolutionary time when modern rabies appeared. Um, you know, bouts of these in, you know, isolated communities, people dying mysteriously people trying to investigate why they died and you know if they dig up a coffin they are potentially confronted with something that no one has seen before um which is you know a, a, a decomposing body right mm -hmm. decomposing bodies uh can look well fed because of the buildup of of gases um mm -hmm. due to the decomposition process they also might be um more preserved than the people were expecting because certainly they were no strangers to death but you know an animal who has died and is sitting sort of like you know exposed to the elements is going to decompose much more differently than a human who maybe as a part of the process of burial was washed put in new clothes put in a box perhaps and then buried mm -hmm. so there's this idea that people in investigating weird happenings would dig up bodies that were not freshly buried but you know not months old and they'd find a relatively healthy looking individual laying in the coffin um and then you you add up sort of the the, the pressure of you know things kind of gross things going on in the body cavity that can push up blood inside like you know through the mouth or or eyes um Yes, and as Derek points out, they potentially can look a little like more pale, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it might appear that they have longer teeth, potentially owing to the idea that, you know, they have fangs. Because our teeth mm -hmm. are much longer than we give them credit for because our gums are in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, the longer nails and longer hair also can, as sort of the, the skin sort of retracts a little bit. So there's this like these like mysterious processes of decomposition that people had to contend with. Um, and then you go ahead and throw in a bunch of mysterious deaths and uh, a mysterious world, and suddenly the, the mind races of like, what is going on? Yeah, that brings up a couple of things specifically. So all of those sort of references to decomposition, um, there is a, a book sort of about the origin of vampires written by Paul Barber, and it's called Vampires, Burial, Burial and Death. And in that, he sort of argues that his belief in vamp he believes that the belief in vampires stems from what you're saying in terms of pre-industrial societies attempting to explain something that they know happens and they know happens all the time, but decomposition in particular is inexplicable. 
Um, and that sort of specific, so like that's happening all over the place globally, right? In all cultures, because all cultures die and all cultures have some form of death rite of some kind. Uh, in particular, um, when you're talking about sort of people coming to check on quote unquote vampires are happening here, um, that book that I mentioned at the very beginning from the 1730s is particularly describing uh, and uh, sort of conversation that these English individuals had with an Austrian officer. Yeah. Um, after in sort of, I believe it was the 1710s or 20s, the Austrian Empire took over northern Serbia, and so for the first time, you have people who don't speak the language and are not really understanding of local culture coming in as imperial, sort of governor or just civil servants, whatever it might be, um, and they're seeing. A variety of things that maybe they haven't seen before and in particular there is a case of a serbian peasant um and i am very very sorry to anyone who speaks serbian but um i'm gonna go with peter blag blagojevic um as the individual that was sort of tr uh tried to have a specific scientific rational uh, sort of um inter investigation of a claim that he was a vampire. Um, and so we have a report from an Austrian administrator um, of sort of the body being exhumed, um, it looking very different than what the individual thought it would look like, um, including specifically um, some of the things that you mentioned about sort of uh, new skin and nails, um, uh, blood being seen around the mouth, um, and sort of, uh, an, when they staked the body, which was the local custom for an ex like a, a, a thought of vampire, um, having sort of noises being heard um, that seemed to be sort of groaning or moaning. Um, and I think in terms, most of the sort of commentary around that account sort of would say that gases build up in the body, they're expelled through orifices. If you were to slam a stake into the middle of the chest of a decomposing body, um, and so that one in particular is where a lot of the medical model of why we think vampires are vampires comes from is that we have this one account and you can basically do a checklist of like, that makes total sense with the decomposing body in particular with an administrator who maybe had the slightest idea what he was doing, but he was there in an official capacity. And so tried to make it seem as appropriate as possible. Yeah. Huh. Um, yeah. Good. I mean, great. I, I don't know what to say other than like, great job bringing specific examples, not my hand wavy. <laughs> like, I remember being told this slash reading this. Yeah. Um, no, but that it makes total sense when you think about it. So if you start, so like, that's why I think in terms of anthropology, that medical model is one of the more convincing. And I think yeah. probably to me is the most convincing because you can kind of do the checklist down of if you didn't know what you were expecting to get out of a coffin and yeah. you opened one up, long teeth long nails, hair still looks like it's still growing. Uh, the body is probably discolored. If it wasn't, um, I guess, exsanguinated, like it might be pooling. Yeah. It might be releasing from orifices. If you stake it with a, a spear, like a stake, it's going to make noise. All of this sort of sounds exactly like what you would assume a vampire myth coming from. And also just because, uh, also, right, we said that we're not really going to talk about other cultures' ideas of vampires. Yep. But we can at least allude to the fact that many, many cultures all around the world have very similar ideas. Uh, unsurprisingly, people die and are buried all over the world or, or you know, uh, you know, uh, the handling of dead bodies is is done in, in a, some fashion in all cultures. So, yeah. of course, you know, if we're looking for a similar vein that like runs through everything, that's a good place to start. And might be a, an explanation for sort of like the uh, convergent evolution of these ideas, even if they're not vampires in totality or in name as how we understand them. That's why they might sound or feel similar in certain ways. Yeah, and that would be sort of the the only pushback that I would have for the argument that it's about pre-industrial societies who don't know about decomposition. Mm -hmm. um, I think I naturally. As somebody who in college I studied uh, medieval and Renaissance or like pre-modern his European history, I r usually reject or push pretty hard on the concept that like everyone was a rube until Michelangelo showed up. <laughs> but like, 
I know that there would be cert there are certainly individual cultures that would you would have the burial process be sort of segmented off in society yeah. and so maybe it would not be known by a lot of them i wouldn't want to make that a universal statement because a lot of cultures certainly would have very advanced knowledge of what decomposition is because they oh. might have a stronger association to that as a cultural right oh absolutely but yeah. It, yeah so in particular that's why i brought up that one singular example because even in that one example what we're seeing is an outsider coming into an isolated culture, they know nothing about it. We don't know how much this officer knew about what decomposition should be. And that officer is then showing a report to somebody who's translating it into English. And that's where we in English understand our vampires. So yeah. is it is that why that's we have vampires or do we have vampires the way we do because it all stems back from this one specific accounting? I have no idea. <laughs> there, there is but I like the, the idea. Uh, yeah, no. That's why the beauty of the social sciences is that we have a variety of theories, <laughs> significantly plausible, and we can't falsify. <laughs> or we can't Just make your science non-falsifiable. <laughs> that's that's not true. The, soci Welcome. Like, the social Welcome sciences to. are can be falsified. They certainly can. Falsified? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's like yeah. I I think like a good basis you throw all that in and suddenly you've got like 75 percent of a vampire or what we understand to be you know a vampire and then you just start tacking in like more and more things um the i think the most logical next sort of thing is just the idea of consuming consuming blood consuming life force um i mean it is I think the, in my mind, the connection is a tiny bit dubious, but one of the diseases that comes to mind when you talk about vampirism or like what people might have thought was vampirism is tuberculosis, which mm -hmm. uh, I don't know when this term was used, but certainly, certainly in the English for a while, we called it consumption because it consumed, it appeared to consume the body of the person who was affected by it. Um, so where was I going with that? There, there's this idea that there's, you know, something to be taken, some fundamental part of a person's being that can be taken from them. Um, and I don't think it takes too many steps to get to the idea of blood being that, that, that something, especially with the, if you throw in the, the tight, the slight connection with blood around like a, a strange looking corpse's mouth. Yeah, absolutely. And so in terms of like, to take your sort of second point, the idea of vampirism as like a disease vector, as yeah. opposed to as opposed to like consumption as a thing that keeps vampires going, which I think is are sort of two separate pieces. Yeah. The, the second as a bloodborne sort of situation, we kind of see that first as vampirism as a disease. Um, I'll buy it. I will be very clear. It is like not treated like we would maybe think of a disease, it is called a contagious demonic possession in <laughs> Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, but it is presumably what they're playing on in the 1890s in London would be the very clear and present and well-known diseases of syphilis and tuberculosis, right? Yeah. So presenting it as a contagious bit of magic is something that I think is because of the understanding of medical knowledge or just the presence of diseases in that way became a little bit different than maybe the rabies or even, which, I mean, there's also sort of porphyria as an excuse for this, but I find that very dubious. Um, yeah. as, a, as, a, as a different way of thinking about disease, like there's that as like isolated village, we don't know what happened there, as opposed to like ubiquitous tuberculosis consumption in yeah. Victorian London. It's kind of I like... Know, it's like a spectrum of things where it's like, I don't believe that porphyria ever actually influenced the idea of what a vampire is. But it's interesting that you can sort of make these connections and be like, okay, maybe some things that vampires are apparently afflicted by are things that people could be afflicted, afflicted by. Uh, being allergic to light is another strange thing that I don't know how that possibly would have been an influence of the myth or like the folklore, but it certainly, 
appears to exist. Um, so like rabies and tuberculosis are the two that are like somewhere else on the spectrum where I can absolutely imagine, you know, you are a Roman in an outlying Roman village and suddenly a wave of like tuberculosis or rabies comes through. What, like, what do you think at that point? Yeah. Right? Yeah, precisely. And yeah, that's interesting. Um, Yes, so um, individual in the chat says many types of porphyria are very sensitive to light. That is, yes, so that is part of the, the theory. I guess my, this is, again, and I'm just trying to be as transparent as possible. My thing is that in sort of my college days, porphyria was trendy. And so, like, if you had a historical figure with a problem, they had porphyria. <laughs> <laughs> so I I would need to see, it seems like we have the answer. Like, rabies is a thing, tuberculosis is a thing, like, we don't need to add on another one, but yeah. who knows? There, there is the light sensitivity. There's the discoloration. There's a bunch of things that that make it make sense. And what Alt Miss Rizzle points out is like Skyrim, which is very much based in Scandinavian folklore. Yeah, vampirism is a disease that you catch, and can be yep. cured, um, which does make yep. me, which does make me wonder. This is like the the specter of, of um a certain type of uh, European Christian thought about like, you know, diseases are demons sort of thing, mm -hmm. which is probably not as widespread as I think. It was probably way more contained in time than I think. But, yeah. you know, at what, wh at what point did people think stuff like, oh yeah, you know, vampire, that's, that's a disease. Like, you know, the difference between disease and mythical condition i don't even know what to call it when those lines were blurred yeah the in the literature there is this interesting connection and from what i've read and what from just sort of looking at the list of them it looks like to me is that when you do not have a sort of character-based culture around vampires when it's just someone is attacking drinking the blood of and killing individuals in my village that is sort of the realm of revenant demon resurrected spirit yeah what have you and it just happens because of the, the blood is the part that makes it a vampire when you start getting character based vampires like ram stroker or significantly as we said briefly earlier in uh Anne rice's books that is where we start to see there being an emotional or personality-based association with turning or siring vampires and so it becomes a more reciprocal relationship as opposed to a a vampire is created that vampire kills people yeah hmm. interesting um, but yeah so in terms of uh did you see the article about how much blood a vampire would need to have to to keep themselves alive yes i did i did i did did you Which... find the methodology perfect <laughs> oh so perfect um no i mean there was some very there was a very me rounding of numbers it was like <laughs> 3.5 so let's say five yeah um <laughs> I, yeah so i did like the the well so this this person it's an it, omg facts article first of all so let's just set a baseline for everyone listening so they understand someone where my brain is someone had a really fun afternoon with this um <laughs> this it was well, me <laughs> first of all this um this has one major like uh uh what's the word it's a fact that you start off with assumption. That's what it yes. is. One major assumption, which is that vampires, they need 2,000 calories a day. Yes, it did start It did start with a, like, how to maintain my BMI with calories. Yeah, so, uh, which, like you, you pointed out, since vampires fall very much within the range of, like, magic, it, it, it's kind of tough, right? Um like is blood the the is blood the river that the life force flows on or are they really trying to get those 2000 calories to maintain their 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 preferred body weight yes um, this is well this is well within my 
reject magic as the solution protocols that I put firmly at the beginning of absolutely, this, of this thing, which basically allows for wild speculation. So, um, they did do a interesting, just interesting job. Um, so they had. I'm not going to share it on screen because that's going to require a bunch of changing sizes of things. We could probably uh, just share some of the numbers just to get a sense, right? That's what I was going to do, yeah. So they had three different um, methods for determining the <laughs> um, amount of blood, which they basically came up with a, an annual body count for. Um, method one is simply asking how much, how many calories a vampire requires and then how many calories are in a certain amount of blood, like a liter of blood, and then sort of back calculate, okay, well, how much blood does an individual have? Therefore, how many individuals does a vampire require? Um, accounting purely by the amount, um, it's, it's interesting, which is a, a very n nice and neat figure of one person per day. One square meal a day. Um, which I believe is, yeah, five liters of blood, which is just a lot of volume, generally. Yeah. Um, and yes, we don't know how many calories you need for shape-shifting or, <laughs> or lurking or any of that. Um, yeah, shape-shifting shape -shifting follows, like, Odo on Deep Space Nine rules. That, like, when Odo becomes a small cup, does he still weigh the same amount and you're just holding an, a ludicrously heavy cup? Or is full grown Odo on Deep Space Nine just extremely light? Yeah. <laughs> I will take that and put it over here. <laughs> um, and it also kind of ignores the, the sort of general thought that, you know, vampires, if not immortal, are extremely invulnerable. Mm -hmm. I would hope that invulnerability is also invulnerability to starvation. Personally, I would hope that. So perhaps... Well, if that was the case, maybe... Well, I mean, if that was the case, why would they ever risk themselves by drinking blood? Because like they a... like it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, uh, but if they had like a, a slower metabolism, mm -hmm. uh, I put in air quotes because who knows what that actually could mean. Um Perhaps they don't need a full person's worth per day. Um, the method two is something I really like. I quibbled really with it like. immediately. I you, quibbled with it immediately. You quibbled with it. Um, oh, it's it's so wrong. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. But that's why I like it. It's it's yeah. method two also has a great title: scaling up sanguivores. So <laughs> yeah. taking how much blood a real organism that consumes blood a sanguivore a good word that i will use as much as possible now mm -hmm. um and then just taking that and multiplying so that you get the weight of a human <laughs> and then just asking if you take that same multiplication number okay now how many liters of blood do you require mm -hmm. um doing that <laughs> the conversion uh which they say is that's a lot of blood is 55 liters per day <laughs> um which is actually just kind of says something interesting to me about the vampire bat, a eight centimeter long, 40 gram bat. So very tiny. Um, just the amount of blood that those things have to consume for their lifestyle. Well, therein lies my quibble because yeah, check me if I'm incorrect, but that methodology presumes that they're killing and draining the cow. Let I me read this. Because um, I think what they're saying is that they are basically saying a vampire can be known to feed on X amount of cows a year. That to me seems like they're taking the volume of blood in a full cow and ascribing it to a bat, wherein <laughs> we know that actually in a feeding, a bat feeds, a vampire bat feeds like a tablespoon or like a teaspoon of blood. Yeah, um, which is not the whole cow. Yeah, they they yeah they're doing a lot of forward and backwards like rounding and assumptions. Yeah. That kind of probably is. I mean, they get to twenty seven milliliters a day. I don't know if I have. Oh, in my and I can uh, appreciate I can appreciate that like a very small creature would need more in particular because it's also pretty calorie light but still that's a lot well you say that but like hummingbirds require an insane amount of calories um, because of their lifestyle 
So that's, yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to say. Oh, sorry. Means. Yeah. Um, just by the way, um, so I have this little tube. It's filled with wasps, which is every scientist's dream. But I don't know if you can see, but about there, up to this point where I'm pointing, I should go over my shirt. Uh, that's 27 milliliters. So that's, you know, 27 milliliters. Wait, that is half. Wait, that is more than half the weight of the vampire bat per day. Is that true? That doesn't seem like it could be true. I don't know how they would fly. Well, that was part of it is that they when I looked at, when I looked up like does it eat the whole cow, which it does not. Uh, they don't fly after they eat cuz they have oh. consumed they have consumed more than they weigh. So they just <laughs> crawl around for a while until it's digested. Oh, evolution is so silly sometimes. Yeah. Whoopsies, I've evolved myself into a corner. I guess I'll just flop around on the ground and hope no one eats me. Yeah, it does, um, yeah. It, it weighs more after it's... Well, obviously it weighs more after it's fed, but it consumes more than the weight of it when it eats. Oh my gosh, that's that's extremely funny. Also, I do like uh, Cliff's idea of maybe they only need blood for flying. Like, airline passengers need tomato <laughs> juice. I, I, I do consume tomato juice while flying. Um... <laughs> that's pretty much how I am after I eat. Eh, okay, that's true. Maybe we're all a little bit more like the vampire yeah. bat than we are willing to admit. Um, I live in the United States of America. I've been to a Thanksgiving. I understand <laughs> what this is. Um, I've also been to. I also have been live in the Midwest, and I've been to a county fair, which is roughly yes. the same situation. Yes. So I know what it's like to have consumed that much. There are cows there too. Um. Okay, but I don't think I actually said this, but that leads to an annual body count of 4,000. <laughs> yeah, um, you're, ta you're taking out like a mid-sized town over here. Yeah, that's that's a lot. All right, um, next up is just the last one. Is is the one that is like most reasonable, but also because it's on the least number, fewest numbers, which is just... This is very... Yeah, this is very me methodology, by the way. It's just existing lore. You know, they didn't want to push the boundaries too much. Uh, so according, and then they link to an article, um, according to this extremely scientific and very real debunking of popular vampire myths, animal blood does not provide Curtis, who is uh, a character from Twilight, right? Curtis, wait. Oh, no, no, no. The, no, no, Curtis they, is our is our just random vampire using random that vampire, yeah. counting website. Yeah. Um, re regardless, um, they're basically just <laughs> rounding up to one point three people per week, just based on having to feed every once in a while. So that brings it to like seventy. Yeah. I mean, and that kind of makes sense from a like, if you think. It kind of makes sense for a couple of reasons. One, like if you think about how long it takes usually for a movie, like timeline yeah. and how many people they take down. I liked it as one of the, this is the best. And this is exactly how I would argue this point is that they used the very short lived, but very fabulous show Moonlight about vampires, which is that they basically kill one a week because the show was on weekly. <laughs> And there was usually yeah. a victim every episode. I see. Like that's, that's just chef's kiss science. So perfect. Yeah, um, it must have been, it must be one a week. So, well, uh, yeah. The I mean, it's it's not a problem, but I, I can't get my head around the like calorie counting like problem like right. Um, I just here let me look up the like volume of food humans consume. I don't think I had to say humans consume per day because <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering. So three to five pounds of food, but. That is not a volume. Eh. So actually, maybe, you know, maybe five liters isn't so much. I'm kind of imagining in one meal. Um, five liters is what? About 3,000 calories? Uh, what was it? Yeah, about 3,000 calories. Um, Yeah, 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 and then then the assumption is also that they don't require anything that is not in blood, uh, and I do not think blood is a complete meal. Um, I did try to look up the nutritional value of blood, and you did share with me uh, the consumption of blood um, via you know various 
foods from around the world. Uh, I don't think generally in America we have a particular food that's like, oh yeah, this is like how we consume blood, a very normal byproduct of keeping and um, eating uh, particular animals for food. Mm -hmm. um, so I know it's like not not or even just husbandry in general because there are there are cultures that don't kill the animal but still brain it. Right, exactly. Um, it is a source of calories, a source of certain nutrients, certainly a source of iron. Um, uh, and I, I just don't think that we, our culture, is is really up on, on consuming blood. But besides that, I was just trying to figure out exactly what is in blood. Uh, blood is mostly water. So there. Um, there's certainly going to be a lot of salts. There's a lot of protein. There's a lot of iron, as you might imagine. That's like the, you know, the thing that everyone probably does know about blood is that <laughs> A, you need it. B, it's red. C, it has a lot of iron. Like, those are probably top three blood facts. Um, in fact, if I search top three blood <laughs> facts. Um, no, but, uh, oh, there are uh, 150 billion red blood cells in one ounce of blood. Neat. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and oh, Miss Rizzo, blood is common in South American dishes. I mean, here, let me just rattle off just for sake of this. And this is not even an extensive list. I'm seeing Portugal, Vietnam, Sweden, France, uh, Great Britain, Italy, Poland, Spain, uh, the Philippines, Taiwan, China, Portugal, which I feel like I already said. Yeah. But yeah, it's um yeah I did already say it. <laughs> they have they get two on the list. Yeah, there were a lot of different uses. The the most common seemed to be like a binding agent, which makes total sense. Yeah, to me, yeah, yeah. If you're already using like meat, but yeah, iron overdose was one that was fun because that was one that yeah. I sort of looked through in in when I was looking at vampire bats as like a how do they connect to vampires? Um, because they're mentioned they're mentioned in Dracula twice but they post date the earlier information that we have about vampires. So it certainly can't be the origin point. It's brought in after naturally in the sort of English literature, it's brought after contact. Right. Um, so that, again, that's another reason why I'm specifically choosing not to discuss cultural vampires from yeah. like Latin America, because I'm certain as I, I'm not discussing cause I'm not certain. So I'll say I am certain. <laughs> I would imagine that there is a closer connection between the actual observed animal behavior and vampires, where you can see that as opposed to, we already have a thing called vampires and now we found an animal that does it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, it doesn't, it's not, I couldn't find a direct sort of reference until um, I Am Legend from the 50s. A character is immune to vampirism um, because they took a trip to south america and were infected or bitten by a vampire bat prior and so there's that you know obviously by the transitive property of sci-fi that means you can't become a vampire yeah there was um um oh wait so um no, i was so, asking yeah yeah so that's yeah if i'm being imprecise that's the point there was not a vampire there was a bat not vampire bat connection that seems to be mostly related to they're both creatures of the night there yeah. is not a connection between an animal bat that drinks blood and vampires until European contact. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Well, I don't know if you want to talk about blood more or... Yeah, but vampires would, need or... To have, vampires would need to have a very specific lining in their digestive tract to make sure that they don't iron overdose. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, unsurprisingly, like most things in life, you can overdose on iron. Um, it's generally not con good to consume just too much of... Um, uh, so, so, so there are macrobiomolecules, like, like fats, right? Um, it, is, it is bad to overconsume fat as a, as a lifestyle, just like it's bad to overconsume carbohydrates, bad to overconsume uh, protein, just general. Um, but then you sort of tick away and get smaller and smaller to the I think I think we call them micronutrients. Let me 
I feel like that's a trendy word and I don't actually know. Yeah, micronutrients. Um, minerals in particular are those things that uh, we do not produce. We get them from the environment. So calcium, right? Calcium is super important. You also should not overconsume calcium. Uh, uh, iron is extremely important. So iron has a special place in certain proteins within our body. The most famous one is hemoglobin, the thing that makes red blood cells red, the thing that red blood cells are filled with. Uh, and you require that iron for the red to do its proper work. Unfortunately, because iron is indiscriminate and our, our biology is such that we are not evolved to be like, oh, no thank you, I've had enough. Our bodies are not, not, be, not on purpose, probably. If, if you give it something, it's going to be like, I'm going to try and take that, right? Because our bodies don't know that we live in a society with a refrigerator full of food. We're, to, uh, to, to our bodies, we're still on the, the, the plains of Africa, you know, maybe days from our next meal. Um, iron overdose is super interesting because iron makes its way into our mitochondria, right? Powerhouse of the cell, because the mitochondria are... Um, inextricably linked with the production of part of the hemoglobin. It's like in there that it kind of gets put in this molecule that kind of holds holds it like a cage. Let me see if I can get a, uh, a picture. Uh, yeah, thank you, Derek. Our bodies are bad at absorbing iron, so they do their, their damnness to hold on to everything they can get. Yeah. Um, the only problem is that iron, uh, due to a special like chemical property, what it likes to do is take oxygen-containing compounds, um, specifically peroxides, and turn them into what are called reactive oxygen species. Now, this is getting super chemistry -y, very chemistry -y. But basically, iron acts as, I don't even know if it's technically a catalyst. It might be. If someone knows chemistry better than me, which is probably everyone, correct me if I'm wrong, but it acts as a catalyst to break apart oxygen-oxygen bonds. And when you do that, you don't have a good time. That's more or less what I'll say. You break that apart and you've effectively made a molecular poison because that will go off and cause all sorts of trouble. Like all, all sorts of trouble. Um, so it's not actually the... Uh, <laughs> nope, I definitely know chemistry better than me. Okay, well, um, so these uh, these are called reactive oxygen species. Um, they go off and cause all sorts of trouble in the cell. It's not good. Uh, I was trying to look and see if you specifically are poisoned by too much iron. I don't think so. I think it's the effect of having too much iron. So if someone knows be better... That it... Yeah, would it be like that it, it doesn't allow for absorption of other things, like it blocks? I don't know. I did not find that because um, I hadn't I... really thought about uh, like iron overdosing before because, oh, so apparently it's a, it's kind of a big deal if, if for children. Um, children can really easily, by taking uh, supplemental tablets uh, in uh, meant for adults, um, have an iron overdose. Um, I don't know if it prevents the uptake of other things. I think Monograd had a oh. answer in the chat expressed the excess gets stores in organs leading to organ damage of varying degrees. But what I'm wondering is through what mechanism, mm -hmm. right? Um, <coughs> yes, I, I wandered me. quite briefly into the role that I play in our Star Trek Adventures tabletop role playing game, which is, as I believe... Uh, you've stated before enough to know when to stop talking. <laughs> Science, <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Um, all I was able to find earlier, and all I am able to find at the moment, is just every time you get too much oxygen or oxygen, iron, um, in a cell, if it is not being ferried around um, or stored in some way, it has a tendency to wreak havoc via this indirect mechanism of creating some creating these small molecules which are very reactive 
And the thing is, when you're in your cell, you kind of want to keep it all safe and nice and tidy. You start creating these these little attack molecules. Uh, it's very bad. You, you just don't want it. It can um, destroy proteins. I think it can even go on to um, cause havoc in your DNA if it manages to make it that far. Yeah. My, so you, yeah. Might, you might add it to the Gaul Udnir T's DNA resequencer. <laughs> it might be a Maybe. problem. Maybe. <laughs> it's it's uh, way less specific than that. It's yeah. more of a... Um, See what firmer ground I am in when we talk about this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, hold on. I'm looking one thing up quick. One, yeah. one, one quick thing. We also have Derek in the chat saying ferritin, the molecule oh, molecule that carries and stores iron, actually goes way up during your effect set. Uh, oh, thank you, all, Miss Rizzle. Um, linked to a paper um, okay. literally titled Body Iron Metabolism and Pathophysiology of Iron Overload. Um, let me see. Zoom in around. The very first line, reactive oxygen species. Yep. Causes organ dysfunction through the production of reactive oxygen species. I mean, if other people are looking this up and coming to the same conclusion that I did, I think that's probably where the major problems are. I mean, you throw you throw something, like too much of something in, like a cell or a body, it's going to cause a host of issues. The question is what's causing the most issues. I'm going to put my, I'm going to put my money on that the host of most of the, the host of most of the issues is uh, these reactive oxygen species, these, these, these small molecules that effectively destroy bits and pieces of the cell indiscriminately in a way that if it happens too much is very difficult to recover from. And you start popping cells here and there within organs, then you're in, you're in trouble. Uh, also, hello, Champ Cal. I see you entered. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're thinking about vampires and all of the sort of visual change or like phys body changes that are taking place when you become a vampire, please keep in mind the lining of your digestive tract would need to be changed as well. <laughs> yeah. I think I did say something about that because, right, because too much iron can cause really severe um, gastrointestinal distress, can't it? Um, yeah. Yes. Now that I couldn't quite figure out why, if that was because of the iron itself or something about just the breakdown of red blood cells, something else was like super uh, annoying to the, to, the, to the gastrointestinal system. Ulcers, constipation. So do you know why though? Is it, is, do you know if, is it because of the iron? <laughs> oh, Alt Miss Frizzle, you make a, uh, you have a very good question there. Yeah. Just that. Um, we touched on that. We have that in notes. Yeah, a little bit. Just um, the yeah, blood. bloodborne diseases. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that like, what do, what do I think about it? Or what do we think about it? It's like. You shouldn't go drinking the blood of someone who might have a bloodborne disease. That's a great way to spread disease, potentially. <clears throat> yeah. Now I'm pretty sure. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that you're gonna be okay-ish if you are. Well, I shouldn't even say that. <laughs> Depending on the disease. Getting into your body is not the same as getting into your cells. Yeah. Yeah, so, we, when, we, yeah. when we were looking, it seemed like from the lore, there, it would seem in the lore that there's less of an understanding of what the circulatory versus the digestive systems are involved. And so the concept of having, like, blood isn't always only part of your digestive system is not necessarily known or like there's no differentiation in terms of the earlier folklore. And mm -hmm. so 
you sort of get the the distinction between them looking like a, a corpse looking flushed because it's filled with blood and not understanding it, like is that because it's circulating or because it's eating like it's in its digestive system and so that's one that by the time we get into sort of post Bram Stoker's literature by that point the common understanding of those are two different systems allows for things like a stronger emphasis on the invulnerability or the like vampires don't get any diseases at all because they have to start um, referencing the fact that they know that your blood isn't always in the same system as your digestion yeah yeah hmm. and in terms of the specific question um uh, about a, a uh, an HIV outbreak um, because of that becoming common knowledge at a certain point they do have that in the Suki Stacko series of books um, there's a very unfortunately uh, named disease called the Sino-AIDS virus which I find problematic for at least two different reasons yeah. um, and so in the True Blood show on TV they changed this to a hepatitis D um, which, to my understanding, is harmless to humans, so they can make it har They can make it very harmful to vampires. Is that true? That I don't know. That I hundred percent thought of, like, looked up whether hepatitis D is like. I think it's a real thing, right? It's just harmless to us. Yeah, hepatitis D is real. Um... So they allowed it to be harmful to vampires. But as I was saying earlier, with the like, he is Superman problem. If you have a thing that's already in humans that's only a problem to vampires, I feel like that wanders quite close to the kryptonite gambit because now you have something that you can just like, ugh, vampires. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like it, it, the sort of underlying assumption is that when you become a vampire, you uh, you you change physiologically in a way that is almost like nearing to another species, right? where certainly there are diseases that can affect one or the other or both, but it seems more restrictive, which is this, which is true of, of certain diseases that we get, can get, or absolutely don't get from other like animals, right? Yeah. And this is another reason why it may not have become something to even think about until sort of Bram Stoker's Dracula is that in some of the earlier folklore, there's no real immediate, there's not a universal connection between the person, the vampire being a person in the first place. Like it could be a revenant. It could be a demonic spirit. Yeah. It consumes people and moves on with its day. There's no need for what a vampire does to line up with a human physiology. I suppose. I don't know that I know that word hundred <laughs> percent. No physiology is good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, but other two other pieces when it came to bloodborne illnesses, because you can see now where I got really excited, is that um, <laughs> thinking about how a digestive system would deal with pathogens. So like, stomach acid is already able to take care of a lot of things. So like, there's already at least like one step to destroying something that might injure you if it was in your digestive system. Sure. Um, Dracula introduces the idea that the body temperature is of, of a vampire is extremely low. So perhaps that makes it a more hostile environment to things that would normally be um, conditioned isn't the word would be um, evolved to work in a system of a certain temperature if it was wildly lower. Yeah. Um, can, and I tell you course, quick, can I tell you a quick yeah. factoid related to that? Um, just because rabies, which we have not talked specifically about yet, but rabies is kind of in this mix. Um, possums are immune to rabies because of their body temperature. It's actually too high, though, not too low. Anyways, oh, nice. sorry, continue. Yeah, so that could certainly be part of it as well. Um, but also there's a episode of Buffy where there's a character, a human character um, that has syphilis and it goes dormant when they become a vampire. Um, and then comes back when they're unvampired. So, I mean, that's definitive to me. Interesting. And yeah. It means, it means that vampires can just sort of blanket deal with oh. human diseases. Sorry, a, an Enterprise. A, a, a oh, Starship gotta, Enterprise flew by. <laughs> I got, this is why I have to be watching the stream. That's my favorite part. Oh, no um i'll do one later okay okay that sounds good um yeah uh, uh i i see 
this is why when we when like the modern interpretations of vampires i love the idea of it being a literal disease because if it's a literal disease then it can be a, a virus or some sort of strange uh symbiotic pathogen right yeah and once you start adding that in adding because you know i'm a geneticist if you add in new dna that that's new potential new possibilities right thrown a new immune peptide and i don't know why but somehow it's makes you immune from everything but as soon as you take it away you get syphilis again um yeah i i i, I do appreciate that um, and maybe this is actually why i i i like vampires in a way is because of the modern interpretations the modern like there's got to be a word for the potentially unnecessary scientification of perfectly reasonable ideas yeah right i think yeah exactly and when i think about that i think specifically about the like nexus point of all i'll call them like universal horror monsters and that is i am legend from 1954 because that is a book in which the author is very clear that what we're dealing with here is vampires yeah and when you read it it's very clear that what you're dealing with is zombies <laughs> <laughs> and but it's a very it's a tipping point between like where we start to differentiate between a variety of different um general evil monsters yeah because we now have a general like a population based understanding of medicine to the point where like the character in i am legend tries to pathologize vampire vampirism with like scientific equipment and like that's sort of the first time that we see that attempt being made and so from that you can't just say like it's a it's a spooky thing at night you have to start saying things like it's a zombie or it's a vampire or it's a werewolf or it's you know right so you have to start breaking these things out because you have to start ascribing science to what is clearly like just cultural knowledge that doesn't require a scientific understanding yeah. in order for it to simply exist well, in a way, I feel like that just shows like a cultural shift in like what people are afraid of. Like, like it, we it's we understand maybe not completely, but we have a greater understanding of disease, even in you know the nineteen fifties, than we ever ever have before. Mm -hmm. So, making I I find it totally believable how now, I mean, God, how many. How many stories could there possibly have been pre-1900 where the central fear or mechanism behind the story was literally a disease versus now I, I feel like not every other book, but plenty of books all center around like a particular disease or like ravaging like a, a, a people, a nation or a planet or something like that. Like that's yeah. that's a new genre after we discovered like germ theory basically mm -hmm. yeah and maybe i'm pushing it too far but like that it should be a, to no one's surprise that i got out of my science credits in college by doing history science credits but like <laughs> just understanding the concept of like we have varney the vampire where it's very clear that it's like magic like it's demonic possession yeah. magic then we have bram stoker's dracula about you know 50 years later in which it's still magic but it works like a disease by all, like it basically is like tuberculosis yeah and the way in which it is described and the fear that somebody reading it in london in 1897 would feel is it's the fear of tuberculosis it's not the fear of a hound of the baskervilles on the moors chasing me down <laughs> and then you know 50 years after that you have an author of the story with enough medical knowledge to not only describe it as a disease but to like in terms of what it feels like, but to actually just straight up call it a disease and have your main character try to study it and solve it. And your solution is not a cross and garlic. Your solution is a microscope and the ability to, you know, diagnose. Yeah. And that's all within exclusive, like basically a hundred years of literature. So I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's evolved it, the underlying like fear has evolved which is strange since the like emergent property of that set of fears is still a creature of the night that consumes blood or people in some you know in some fashion 
it's still you could be hurt while you're sleeping yeah yeah that's so cool i mean i feel like i've thought this before but never like synthesized that as a complete sentence so yeah that's yeah no that's 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 cool that's a cool thought i like that a lot actually um it makes me want to now look and see if anyone's written a i am legend so obviously there was the will smith movie which did update (laughs) just the equipment that he was using on the side Mm -hmm. but now i want to see if you know there's a there's a i guess it would just be a knockoff but another vampire one that's even trying to be more modern and scientific like throwing throwing a vampiric samples through a high throughput yeah. sequencing machine and doing PCR on vampire blood or yeah. whatever. Well, and I would wonder because I, in my brain, yeah, if you took it one step further than I am legend, I don't know why they're not zombies. That's why I want like to find it. this hypothetical book because I'm curious, yeah. how does it maintain its, its, uh, uh, vampiriness. Um, yeah. Actually, are you aware of the? I think it's Guillermo del Toro. That series, that was a very Eastern European vampire. Shoot, why can't I think of it? Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm, yeah, like a TV show. TV show. It was probably from 2014 or 15. Uh, are you talking about? You're not talking about Dark Shadow, are you? He wasn't mm-hmm. attached to that, I don't think. No. Um, hold on. And and it wasn't his movie, which was... Wait, was that Guillermo del Toro? The Strain, Manogard. Thank you. The Strain. Oh. I don't know if you remember this, but in The Strain, uh, the vampires... They, they actually kind of go into a shocking amount of like biology, but the vampires are quite different. They're yeah. a little bit more monstrous. Uh but their physical, mental um, changes and their the changes of their physiology come down to uh, the people's bodies being ghoulishly inhabited by what are effectively parasitic worms. Um, wait, in a very similar way to the Korean series, The Kingdom. Uh, now that I yeah. think about it, very yeah. similar way, actually. Yeah. If that was the case, I would call that a zombie. They're pretty vampire-y. Like, for some I reason... I think that my inter- the strain is they, they name it, like, ancient vampirism, right? Yeah. Um, clear about it? Yeah, it's something... Yeah, it's... Uh, I think I saw, like, one or two episodes and I just bounced, but... It's... I yeah, mean, I mean, that's... It's interesting. that's in- yeah, exactly. And it also... I remember that one touching a little bit on... You know, because of the sort of giving personality to vampire they're one of the other offshoots that is a re- sort of i would say return to maybe earlier form is the idea of the like vampire as beast angle so yeah i you know for you know maybe people sort of of our media consumption generation i think of things like 30 days of night where like the the connection to a human psyche is reduced and the human is sort of more of a feeding situation exclusive yeah yeah not really interested in turning or having a relationship with but yeah yeah the the vampires there are mostly yeah they're mostly monstrous and they're mostly there to provide like the antagonist so that they can simply eat people without any like regard for well, they're not anything. interested in having a conversation. No, um, with the exception of sort of the main vampires who are yeah. who exist, um, and strangely are are the worms, like like if you're colonized by enough of a certain type of worms, they become you, kind of like a, like a ghoul <laughs> situation sort of thing, or no, not ghoul, more survive. like a uh, uh, what are they called, a trill sort of situation. Oh, so something of the host survives. Yes, <laughs> something of the well. That is the Gaul Trail dichotomy. They're blended. They're blended together. I think. I. It's been a while. I feel like, and I never well, finished it. Um. But yeah, no, that was um very much trying to like scienceify biology, biology e, sort of. 
this monster. Um, mm-hmm. I can't believe I'm I'm just now remembering this. Like a flash of like you know watching three seasons of this came mm-hmm. back to me all of a sudden. Yeah, and I think because I think because the siring of tra- vampire like transference has become so ubiquitous. I think that's why you get if it's transmitted via like bite disease where like it's not intentional i think you, that's why we have things like zombies or other monsters because it became so completely central that a vampire has to intentionally turn you yeah i think that's why we it sort of that split became well i no longer am required to figure out why scientifically the disease is passed if it's just someone bit me intentionally <laughs> Let's see. Um, just for a warning, because I, I have to get up to do class tomorrow. I'm not on a tight 15 more minutes, but I'm on a 15 to 30. So just yeah, FYI. I feel, so if I there's anything you really want to talk about, we should start talking about it now. Yeah. Um, one thing I kind of want to talk about was rabies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, no. Would we rather talk about rabies or immortality and agelessness, which I love. I... I cannot claim that I I pulled out these pictures. The, did you look at the immortal animals? Oh, absolutely. Oh, those, that's what I liked. Those jellyfish. Will, the only point that I wanted to make, which has nothing to do with anything, is that um, one of the oldest things that is attached to the idea of a vampire, like long before we had the word for it, is that they are compelled to stop and count spilled grain along their path. Oh yeah. And so it was sort of a an, a tradition to spill grain around the grave because then if a vampire came out, they would be they would take so long counting that you could find them and stake them in time. <laughs> Which means that Count von Count on Sesame Street is derived from our oldest and most central vampire folklore. <laughs> the counting. <laughs> Which is very, very pleasing to me. That's uh oh that's wonderful. Also crucial to an episode of the X Files. The counting aspect is that the one with where they're at like the community of vampires it's called bad blood yeah i like that but episode the, it's been yeah. a while since i've seen it though they they also dig into the old counting myth but I, that has no science to it that's just uh, that's just hilarious that i like like it's it reminds me of like whenever you go like i want the old creepy hans christian anderson myths not these new things and it's like the oldest vampire count von count <laughs> rice <laughs> <laughs> yeah but let's talk about um immortal animals because this just looks super fun and the concept of like is an is a vampire immortal ageless invulnerable or just dead yeah well as as like foils for like humanity it's like every vampire was born sometime in the 1800s <laughs> for some reason um, they were and... born when when the sort of gothic fashion would uh, was appropriate yeah um uh for some reason uh yeah I- exactly like um gothic like the literary tradition not gothic like hot topic yes um so so in a weird way like we actually don't know the the outer edge of the like vampire lifespan uh but in some way they are like you know a little bit dorian gray without the hang-ups um (laughs) uh yeah so they have a certain amount of immortality uh, apparently um and a certain amount of not just immortality apparently like we haven't been treated like we've been treating this like it's in they're real sorry i can't help it i mean that's just how i speak about these sort of things i i, I mean it. within the context of this 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 topic which is about fake creatures from what we understand from the literature <laughs> um we know um that they are immortal and have a certain amount of uh agelessness to them so the most famous example of not the most famous the example that is popularly known and honestly it's just like kind of the one that we know of um is this particular immortal jellyfish uh so turritopsip turritopsis dornii um which i'm just going to call the jellyfish because <laughs> i i didn't bother even to look up what that uh means 
uh, these days. Honestly, if it was named within the past couple decades, it's probably just two people's names. Names, yeah. Made like Latin esque or Greek esque or both. Immortal De- Immortal Jellyfish is cool. Immortal Jellyfish, yeah. Um, so Jellyfish here. This time I will kind of put this on screen because I might be able to fit this on here. Yeah. So. Um, the sort of fun thing about jellyfish, first of all, see, jellyfish are interesting, I think, regardless of, of um, them being immortal or not. Because what we think of as jellyfish are actually just one stage of the jellyfish life cycle when they are these um, medusa uh, forms, which, great name. Thank you, science. Um, and that's what the typical uh, jellyfish looks like. Um, they go through a reproductive cycle where they release gametes. Um, these meet up and go through a small amount of embryogenesis, and they become a what I'm pretty sure is a free swimming larva. Um, this larva eventually, more or less, plants itself. Right? Uh, it sits down on a surface and and forms a polyp. So this is. Uh, a polyp is exactly how this is like shaped right here. It's like a extrusion and it sort of branches out um, on, on, on the tips. And this is like the cool part that I think most, if not all jellyfish do, is one of these polyps is one organism, right? It's simple, but it's one organism. It has the DNA of that gamete, those two gametes that came together to form an embryo. But then this polyp will bud off, meaning it will split off uh, individuals, many individuals potentially. And then so that's where we get this next stage, which I didn't know had a, a name, but it's like a premature medusa, basically. It's, it's, it's going to be start growing and it's like a, a pre-adult form. So as a polyp, one individual can make clones of itself. I don't know how many, tens, hundreds maybe. Um, at some point, this polyp will sort of stop and end, um, but then it sort of goes back through this Medusa cycle. Um, the cool thing about this particular jellyfish is that they have this this second path, sort of denoted here, where um, upon some hardship, potentially, uh, they begin to die or in some way just like they they they're they're lacking a a stable environment or something i was trying to look up if we knew exactly what caused this it's unclear it might even just be a certain percentage like when they get old enough they just kind of do this they sort of degenerate back into a ball of cells drop down like it says here oh it even says ball of cells drop down become a polyp again and then restart the cycle all over again Effectively meaning that at some point, two gametes merged, formed an individual. And that individual can go through a cycle of, of adulthood and then reversion and then clonally expand itself over and over and over again. And I, it's just unclear to us whether or not this thing ever technically dies. Because the thing that I think is sort of lost when people talk about this, because a lot of people do know about the immortal. Have you heard about this immortal jellyfish before before this? I had heard about the jellyfish that basically, I heard about the de-aging jellyfish, which I think is what is the same thing. Right? This is what like, that is, yeah. It's a jellyfish that makes, it's just a baby. Like, it's a Benjamin Button jellyfish, but... The, yeah, the, the thing, like, the thing that I think is lost on not a lot of people, that sounds mean. The thing that isn't focused on is this polyp stage right here. So you get one organism, you end up as a polyp, that makes, let's just say 10 jellyfish. All 10 of those can de-age into 10 new polyps, each of which make 10 more jellyfish. So now you have 100 of the same individual, and then over and over and over again. So they can clonally, when I say clonally expand, I mean that they can make identical copies of themselves. That's just a normal jellyfish thing, in addition to this cool phenomenon of of not rebirth but rejuvenation, um, so these so, jellyfish can clone themselves, de-age, and live forever. Yes, <laughs> pretty much. 
Um, Alt Miss Frizzle asks, um, what does that do for genetic diversity? Uh, probably not a lot. So um, I, I am sort of, or we are making the assumption that all of these survive, which they probably don't. Um, but potentially this is a super clever way of essentially making sure that your genes are passed along at some point, right? If, if, if you have... 10 clones of yourselves and nine are eaten and you just have, are having a hard time, well, you can drop out of your adult form, go back to being a polyp and make 10 more of yourself to try it all again. At, at some point, it's a numbers game. One of you is going to is gonna reproduce. Um, so I think it actually makes evolutionarily a lot of sense. Um, in terms of survival, it's it's sort of ensuring that if all else fails, you might have this little backdoor cheat to turn back not into a younger form of yourself because you want to, you know, I don't know, like your tentacles are a little bit more saggy or wrinkly and you just kind of want a little refresher. It's not because of that. It's because you want to clone yourself in this in this. Um, oh, I'm I'm hovering over the wrong thing. I was hovering over the stream, not the actual page. You want to clone yourself in this this juvenile yeah. form, not not that you want to refresh, right? Um, evolution doesn't care that we die. Absolutely not. Uh, it's probably better for most organisms to die to give way to the next generation. That's all evolution cares about, except in this... This is probably not the only case of this, just the only case we've found... In this case, it's a, it's like a clever trick, like you know. I don't know. Does that make sense? Did I sort of explain that in a way that's sort of clear? Yeah, this totally. Clear? It totally makes sense because it is, because obviously from my angle, it's so. What would that? What would this look like in a vampire circle? But like this, clearly, this is missing the concept of like a consciousness. Yeah. Exactly. I mean. And I really like if, if the ball of cells can remember that it was a dying Medusa, then this is immortal. But if there's no consciousness yes. anywhere in here, then there's no concept of mortality. Big it is right? simply a method of propagation. In yeah. my mind, this is not too far from what every bacteria does, which is simply copy itself, like copy itself ad infinitum. Uh, right? There's 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 no start. There's no end. It's just always copies on copies. Yeah. Um, and I, I will ask that when I use this for one of our Star Trek <laughs> sessions as an alien species, you don't tell everybody else. <laughs> okay. Tell everybody else what? That I knew you were going to do it or that I recognize it? That part of the mystery is that this cycle is at play. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah. My character won't know that. Don't worry. Um, yeah, so... So I knew this was different than vampires, right? But but this is still the closest thing we have to a measure of immortality. That's what it is, is a measure of immortality. Well, um, if there was consciousness built into this, basically where you would be moving is that it, like the dying vampire can somehow like take its most essential vampirism and transfer it on into... Like maybe that, like if it was a situation in which when a vampire sired a vampire, what they were doing was passing on their most essential vampirism ball of cells. They too would be immortal in this exact same way, right? May I ask if you've seen the newest season of What We Do in the Shadows? Yes, and that's where I was headed, but I was going to do a spoiler warning. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Spoiler yeah. alert. Um, I, was going to just, I was going to say, if that is the case, we yeah. may have seen this in vampire culture already yeah basically um yeah do you want to just explain it um yeah i guess if you are particularly pressed about spoilers for our vampire comedy show um there in season three there is a character that is um a sort of subset of vampires called the emotional vampire um and that individual seemingly dies um but from within emerges a smaller slightly different um version of a vampire 
<laughs> uh, that seems to be aging rapidly, but having a, a perhaps same, perhaps different personality. It's a very nature versus nurture plotline in season four. Yeah, and uh, Cliff points out that in planarians, so planarians are flatworms, uh, similar things happen, and apparently there are persistences in memory in the clones. I did not know that. Yeah, that's um, very cool. But I would argue, so I, 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 I'm agreeing, but also disagreeing, because I think that's something parallel but different. Um, just because that is, from what I understand, more similar to um, the fact that planarians will simply split themselves in two, and they have such high regenerative uh, regenerative abilities that they can regrow entire bodies from the smallest group of cells because of a special subset of cells called neocytes that they have locked within their bodies that are primed, ready to go to rebuild anything. This, these, these, um, the process, Benjamin whether or not you know this, um, the process that uh, Colin Robinson is going through and what these jealous, je jellyfish are appear to be going through is something called um, transdifferentiation, where um, in the normal course of cellular development, we very obviously go from one cell to many cells. That one cell was not any of the types of cells that we have in our bodies. It mm -hmm. differentiated. It made, it's it it multiplied, and those different multiplications took different tasks, which is why like my eyeballs are my eyeballs, and my stomach is my stomach. Right? Those cells went down different paths. Mm -hmm. What this jellyfish is doing is is by I, I'm gonna say choice, but jellyfish are extremely simple. It's more like a series of chemical reactions occurred, and what its cells decided to do was be like, all right, we're going back. <laughs> Go back to the beginning. Let's do this again. Yeah. Um, so they, rather than always moving forward in sort of the types that of cells that we are, they, on the course of their whole body, because people are going to possibly argue with me, because sometimes our cells do move backwards to a degree. To a degree, um, in the normal course of their lives, they can sort of send their entire body backwards, um, like moving backwards and forwards in cellular time. Uh, which is wholly unique. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, and I really wish I could bring you like, oh yeah, and this is why, or this is how. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know how. Um, not at all. It, it, it's like well, people did some, like, uh, some research that I skimmed through. They're doing like the fundamental work that you need to do to figure out, okay, what is causing this? And the summation of those papers were like, I don't know, but we found some cool stuff. We don't know yet. Nice. Because um, there are a lot of problems in being immortal, right? Yeah. Um, one of the main things is like, let's say you're immortal, right? And you get a cut. Right, mm -hmm. or let's just say that you are invul not what's the word not invulnerable, but you are um, like if you were a vampire and lost an arm, would you regrow that arm? Let's say you could. I don't sure. know. Um, there's there's a problem. Let's say you had you. Let's say you had regenerative regenerative properties. Regenerative properties. Yeah, thank you. The um, Wolverine syndrome. So certainly some organisms have, like planarians, extreme regenerative properties. Um, but problems arise with those that you need to solve. If you didn't have these properties that I'm sort of thinking of, and we still don't understand fully, when you're causing a bunch of, of cells to divide, every time your, a cell divides, it's a chance for a mistake. And every mistake is a chance for death, or even worse, not even worse, but um, death of the cell, um, which is why even worse is cancer. Um, so, that is not the only time your cell can make a mistake and you can end up with a cancerous cell which can evolve into a tumor. Um, but part of the, not the only reason, uh, but part of the reason why humans go through um, senescence, um, the or the and the general age-related breakdown of tissues and organs is because in very, very broad strokes, mistakes are made. <laughs> over time 
Um, but that pulls in multiple things. We also have these things called telomeres that get shorter. Those probably have something to do with it. We're not exactly sure. Um, just broad changes of cells as time goes on because we don't have really a mechanism to turn back the clock and we don't have a mechanism to fix the changes that occur. We don't have a good way of replacing the cells that need replacing. So there's a lot of like barriers to this. Yeah, and I think that that's why the breakdown was interesting to me because when you say like, vamp like vampires don't die. Okay, well, well what does that mean? Like, yeah, as you said, if they get wounded, well, it means that they have regenerative properties at that point. Is it that they don't age? Well, then they don't, you know, then they don't have the tithiness problem, right? Like, they're they're not a grasshopper because they were given, you're gonna live forever, but we are still gonna make you age. Like they clearly are ageless then at that point too, um, and then like. Well, if they well they don't age, they can't be killed except for very specific ways to kill them, which is always love in folklore that there are like specific ways. the The one that I love the most is the the folklore of James Bond, which is like if I shoot you with a golden bullet, you die. But if I well, what happens if it's just a bullet bullet? Like, will you <laughs> die then? Um, and so you sort of break down all of the various to say that like a vampire doesn't die and doesn't age and can live forever and heal itself, it starts becoming a lot more than just a vampire's immortal. Which I quite like. And it actually, they come up in various parts of literature. Like, these things are added on. But they're not added on, I think, in the way that you would normally think. Because, like, the agelessness one came first, it would seem. Because there was a, a stronger understanding that, like... There was a stronger understanding that you would need to account for aging before you would need to account for how does your body fix itself, if it's that Oh yeah, yeah. No, I think. Um, I mean, I mean, the uh, the science of aging and regeneration is I, is young. I don't. I don't know if that's a pun, but I don't mean to make that pun. <laughs> um, uh, young but strong. Yeah, it, it's just that um, we really don't know. <laughs> we don't have a good grasp of what's going wrong. Um, we know like many of the things that are probably contributing. Um, you're getting compliments, compliments in the chat, by the way. Um, oh, oh well, thank you, Miss oh, Miss Frizzle. Um, it's been a delight responding to chat tonight. It's been a good chat, yeah. as it usually is, frankly. Oh yeah, chat's always great. Um, now I forgot what I was saying. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, but I feel like the concept of being immortal is way easier to grasp. I mean, because like the fact that there are things that existed before you as a person existed and will persist after you as a person mm -hmm. exists, like that's an easy concept for people. Um, much more so than the idea of of the effects of change. Yeah, and I, I like that vampire because by the time they get to the ageless part of it being entrenched in the literature, one of the many cool things that I will keep going back because it's for me it's my favorite addition to the lores in the um, sort of Anne Rice novels and in particular in Ruth the Vampire. There's the playing with is it that you are a specific age of like perfection as mm -hmm. a vampire, which is a specific age depending upon what your culture deems that to be. Or is it that you are the age that you were when you were turned? And so we have obviously sort of Claudia who is turned as a child and now you have an adult mind trapped in a child's body mm. as a vampire. And so at that point, I mean, is, is that looking like an attractive vampire uh, living forever if you always had to be like seven, but your brain was 45? Like that's sort of the the part that in literature is more interesting about like, what does agelessness mean as opposed to what does it mean for your actual bodily functions? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, again, in what we do in the shadows, there, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a character that's like a child, right? And like they're super. That's played with. It's played. With, yeah, so they've played with in the first. It's it's one of those like vampire tropes now, which is that like you have a a child, or in the case of the show, which is even funnier, like a baby. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Who's just screaming and crying all the time because they have the thoughts of a forty-year-old, but they can't talk. Right. Um. That's like something that is whoa. 
Whoa, it just got a... Uh, it's been raided. raided. Yeah, so welcome, Raiders, and thank you, uh, Samuel Animates. Uh, hello, welcome. We're talking about some vampires, and I have jellyfish up the, on the screen because we're talking about immortality. Um, but thank you for the raid. Uh, uh, yeah, keep tuning in for the last little bit of, of stream before I have to head out because <laughs> I have to get... teach class tomorrow. Yeah. Um, uh, Yes, yeah. Altness Frizzle. It's very, very sad, and it's one of the more inventive parts of, of those books for me. I think her story is one of the more interesting. Um, yeah. So this is like this is something that this is such a good point. I don't know why we haven't really thought about, or I I have not really thought about this before. Um, you know, age is sore. It's biological, but it's also a construct, right? Like if you yeah. went into a coma in which you had no sort of dreaming or memory and then suddenly came out of it fully like fully you know full mental capacity like intact but that was like a 40 year span well then you lack the experiences of like 40 years you probably feel like the wrong age in the wrong body so the opposite is true of anyone who ever ends up being immortal by accident you know are you stuck as a baby are you stuck, you know, extremely old and potentially like incapacitated by age related degeneration that you're just, like trapped in? Um, yeah, something the, that I've looked at recently, but need to look into more is the concept like extrapolating that into like your brain is that my like, it's an interesting portion of some writing that I've been doing recently of yeah. thinking about what does it mean to have a human have their life extended with your brain and so like knowing not enough to make any statements but knowing that like there is a certain limit before start stuff starts becoming a problem and so what happens if you have way too much time of memories or knowledge or experiences or expertise in your brain what would start to happen at a certain point yeah um sorry i'm just uh doing something quick there yeah i'm feeling i unfortunately have to kind of bring this to a to a close as well with oh, you do. maybe a, a thought a thought or a thought a last thought or two okay that. yeah no um sounds good to, to let you finish to let you sort of put a button on this if you want the agelessness thoughts Oh, uh, did I have any con additional thoughts on that? Uh, no, other than it's extremely interesting. And um, I actually really, again, really, really like this whole mode of immortality that, that um, not unfortunately, but I was going to say unfortunately um, comedic vampire show is doing. Like, I, I, I kind of wish that was being explored in something that was less comedic and kind of like, cause, cause they're not going to talk about the implications probably. No. It's, it's for a laugh. It's for a joke. It's a good joke. It's a good, it's a unique concept. Yeah. I, I, which makes me kind of pine for a different property to have been like, Oh yeah, this is why Edward Cullen is so young and like, you know, whatever he, he, he goes from age 12 to age 25 and then he dies and a 12 year old bursts from his chest. <laughs> right. Sure. Like um, they don't have to make it more biological, but yeah. I feel like the, the, the easiest way to explain immortality is, is through something like this trans differentiation. The more I read about it, the more it kind of, it kind of solves the problems. Well, yeah, because at this point, it basically becomes like essence transfer, right? Or like it becomes um, uh, like as as guardians, right? Like your consciousness is put into a, a, a cloning vessel of your existing body. Your existing body is cloned into something. Your essence is posted into that new cloned body. Yeah. It still comes from you, but it's sort of moved on. Or like altered carbon to a degree. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, I think at this, like, that's what I would maybe, like, if that jellyfish had a mind, <laughs> I would maybe call it essence transfer. Yeah. I, I actually am, so, so, the, the, the jellyfish has one sort of problem in this, which is, um, I, so jellyfish do have neurons, but they don't have a 
They don't have a brain. Mm -hmm. um, they have collections of neurons that may help with simple tasks. I mean, I mean, jellyfish are some of the most simple um, multicellular organisms that there are, right? They really don't do much except to respond to stimuli. They don't, they don't have an opinion at all. <laughs> um, what lets them, I mean, what that kind of lets them do is get away with this, these shenanigans, right? <laughs> um, we can't melt our body and expect to reform our brain as it was before. Um, yeah. Because so much of the brain, even though we don't quite understand the, the uh, origins and, and uh, there's like, we, we know that it's structural. We know that there are neurons. We even know where a lot of those neurons are and where the connections are. But then the middle part, which is an arrow that is labeled emergent property to consciousness, thought, and memory, that's that's much more of a mystery. But we implicitly know <clears throat> that if you were to go in with magical like tweezers and without harming the brain, simply moved around the connections, that would so severely alter thought, memory, function that you've effectively like you start altering the person, right? Yeah. Their very being in a way. <clears throat> so that is still kind of a problem. And I say a problem in that a, a sort of a problem of this idea of of this type of regeneration. Like I would love if someone could think of a way to mold the idea of a vampire and mold the idea of this trans differentiation, this idea of full body renewal. Mm-hmm. And whether or not it's effectively like Doctor Who, but what if every time Doctor Who became a new being, yeah. they lost all memory? Yeah, well, and I think it'd be very ripe for literature that focuses on <clears throat> the addition of the familiar as like a human that has to take care of a vampire, mm. because as the literature progressed and characters became a thing in the like, you know, 20th century, this connection between having to give vampires weaknesses means that you have to have people around to protect them at certain times or do tasks for them. Yeah. And it would seem like in that jelly, if that jellyfish was a vampire, there are very specific times in which you would need someone to take care of you. And it could be useful as a literary device to tell a, that type of specific story with vampires if there was a you have to take care of this little vampire ball at a certain point <laughs> before yeah, it becomes yeah. 10 more vampires, all of which remember and know you. I, I want someone to write this book now because I'm now I'm just very interested. Like, you know, if you suddenly woke up as a fully formed being, but but you lived in the body of someone you did not recognize in a mm -hmm. house that you did not recognize but then you implicitly know like oh yes this was me but it also wasn't me mm -hmm. right if you just popped into existence having known that an a not potent not infinite but a innumerable number of yous existed and lived full lives before you yeah well and that's a common trope of like the vampires who don't know what's going on to them like they don't know they don't have a vampire to explain the vampire rules this could be right for that as well, that when they reach the sort of point in which they're starting to die and are reborn, imagine sort of not knowing that that's part of the process. And so you're sort of preparing mentally for death and not realizing that. Mm. No, what I need to be preparing for is the idea of being okay with nine other clones of me. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and also being that just, ju just the newest in a even longer, potentially, line of clones. Yes. Oh. Okay. Well, um, do you want to wrap it up there? Yeah, I think that's good. I mean, as I to share with stream, I told yes. um, I told you that I would pre over prepare. I have delightfully done so, <laughs> and so there are certainly more topics um, to talk about, maybe at a later date or in the discourse community um, that you've built up. So certainly, I can probably add a couple notes in there to maybe see if anybody has further things to chat about but we did actually cover a lot more than i thought we would which is pretty great yeah absolutely um i i i did notice uh cliff you mentioned polyploidy so if um you have to get going i am going to stick on stay on for a couple more minutes and talk about polyploidy 
I could do five minutes of polyploy. Okay, okay, okay. I, I don't want to force you to stay or force you to go. So do whatever you want. <laughs> also, I, I will. I don't think anyone's ever said I could do five minutes of polyploidy. That's a new sentence that no one's ever said before. So congratulations. Um, so polyploidy, for those who don't know, is a, a word that describes a, uh, a, 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 a large number of copies of the DNA of an organism always a eukaryote um just because okay. it has it you got me scared that it's going to be some form of audio clip they're going to take of me now because nobody would have said it being so foolish but go ahead sir. <laughs> um so uh so like in giant bacteria and stentors yeah so there are a couple different types of organisms um that i know of that have a huge resistance to um certain types of DNA damage. DNA damage is bad. Why? Because DNA has all the instructions to make every single one of your cells. Um, but the problem is that if you start breaking up that DNA, you get mistakes. Every time you break a piece of DNA, your cell has to put it back together. Your cell is, it's not stupid, but it doesn't have a brain. So it doesn't know how to put DNA back together. So when it tries, it can sometimes lead to mistakes. Those mistakes lead to a breakdown in that cell's function or whatever. Anyways, um, so stentor, I'll skip stentor, uh, bacteria, um, some bacteria, so there's this one called Deinococcus radiodurans, one of the very few scientific names that I know because it's so cool. It has multiple copies of its genome uh, inside of it. And so when it's blasted by radiation and that DNA breaks up, it basically is like, fine, whatever, take it. And then it looks around and it looks at all the overlaps of the pieces of DNA and simply stitches them all back together like nothing ever happened. Okay, so whether or not polyploidy could solve the problem of DNA damage. Yeah, that certainly could. Um, the only problem is that I don't know about whether or not that would fully solve the problem um, because when you're talking about something like us a type of eukaryote that has chromosomes we have ends to our dna and the thing is those ends get shorter every single time we copy it um, and although that's not the causative agent of of aging disease and death it's uh, certainly a part of it so you need to maintain that somehow and we actually talked on stream, not last time, but like last Wednesday, I think, about a frog that has 12 copies of its genome per cell, which is a crazy number. And as far as I'm aware, that frog is not immortal, right? <laughs> that frog has three times as much DNA as this like super radiation resistant bacterium. Um, so it's clearly missing something. And honestly, that something is just all the other stuff, right? <laughs> it's kind of like saying that you can solve the need for a car mechanic by simply having the manual for your car. Sorry. Well, just because I have the manual for the car doesn't mean I have a replacement uh, axle. I don't have an extra engine lying around, right? I don't have the parts necessary. Maybe that's not yeah. the perfect one. I don't have the tools. Or I don't have the skillset. tools yeah. or skill set. Yeah, exactly. Um, to put, you know, a car back together given any amount of, of damage, right? Some people do, which is why some organisms are extremely resistant to damage to DNA. Um, so I do like the idea of <laughs> vampires are polyploid, but I don't think it, fit, it fixes every problem we have so far. <laughs> um, it, doesn't, it doesn't fix the how much blood they'd have to actually consume. Exactly. Is it five liters or 55 liters? We'll never know, unfortunately. Gotta be one of the two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, that kind of suggests to me that perhaps vampires are good at eating themselves. Maybe. Maybe they're, I don't know if they're a, a, a nutrient-rich source or if they're, like, kind of thin and not Oh, actually... at, like, draining the blood of each other. Oh, I meant, like, you know... If you were, I don't even know what sort of types of morals this would be, 
if you were some sort of vampire hunter and ate your kill? Would a vampire provide a, a fulfilling meal? Oh, sh- okay. You know, All right, 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 at the right, right. Van Helsing family Thanksgiving, you know, they and they well, serve. Well, if they're dead, <laughs> I wonder what happens to the nutritional value of muscle when it's not animate. I don't know. I don't know. And I just bounced off the top of my ceiling of knowledge. <laughs> Oh, Miss Rizzo, you wonder if they grow some special organelles. Who, who, ooh, oh, what if vampirism is due to endosymbiosis? Oh, my gosh. Uh, does the word Wolbachia mean anything to you, Benjamin? No. Okay. I thought maybe that had something to do with... Wolbachia? Wol- Wolbachia. I thought that had something to do with... Um, not Transylvania, wherever. Oh, know. like Wallachia? Wallachia. Oh, okay. I'm just mixing up those words. Yeah. Wallachia. So, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, sorry, everybody. I'm mixing up two things. Wolbachia is an endosymbiont in insects. Wolbachia is a phrase to describe, I will assist you <laughs> in your endeavor. <laughs> Wol- Wolbachia. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Rabbit hole finished though. I would love to talk about polyploidy and 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 vampiric organelles <laughs> any other time or place. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to have you on again and we can continue talking because I never even got to talk about rabies. Uh, my my most feared disease. Yeah. Don't, well, don't get rabies. Were, yeah, if you were to as sort of fall and the days grow shorter, discussions of other monsters like zombies might be conducive to talking about rabies or frankenstein's monster or frankenstein's monster the the monster of science itself <laughs> of gothic science the specter of doing science That's yeah my biggest oh yeah werewolf um ooh, rabies yeah um yeah p- no no actually don't get rabies everybody yeah werewolf werewolf is great this all started because i was talking to you about one of my favorite shows ever penny dreadful yeah um, it's got all this good stuff in there, and certainly the agelessness conversation would come into play some of that too. So, uh, Mr. I'm... Mr. Gray, but yeah, that's I would certainly be happy to to talk again about any of these in particular. If people um, sort of in the Discord or in chat sort of have ideas that we can sort of dig into. My area of let's put quotes around it expertise is in sort of that universal monster, um, sort of Penny Dreadful type. Yeah, um, but I'm very. I was fascinated that obviously, even sort of going through and checking some of my assumptions, finding a lot of new cool information about just the history of vampire literature, and finding like where where the non attribute of a non creature comes from. Like it's pretty good, cool. pretty cool. Cool. Um, yeah. So, is there anything you want to? personal projects you want to plug or anything like that you don't have to um, don't feel pressured. Yeah, sure. no i can pretty i can briefly so i i'm not a streamer um but uh my creative endeavors are a bit more uh writing based and so i may as well plug here if anyone's interested i'm finishing up and um sort of posting the final two chapters of a novel length star wars um fanfic that i've been working on it's uh canon compliant but i'm not particularly <laughs> pressed about canonosity um and it's on uh, archive of one's own the one of the greater websites ever produced by man so um if you're not familiar with archive of one's own it's a fabulous um sort of nonprofit for posting fan work and so um you can search my username nascent novice i'm the only one on there and you should get it it's called the beacon set at the end of the clone wars it's about sort of four individuals um, who are at the Beacon, which I've decided is a news or- organization. Yeah. Um, it's, it's four journalists uh, sort of investigating a murder that takes them into a series of uh, larger and larger plots, which if you're familiar with Revenge of the Sith, you might know what that plot is. So um, yeah, it's, it's original characters written in POV style, like The Expanse. And so if you're interested, my suggestion with all things on AO3 is read the first chapter because you can do chapter by chapter. And if it's of any interest to you, there's 33 in total. And if you have any questions about, like, this is really long and I want to know some answers before I dig in, you can find me on Twitter, Nason Avis, or certainly in the Discord for this community. Awesome. Um, I do think uh, canon compliant 
would just make a good tattoo just by itself just some, <laughs> somewhere on your body just to let sure make ev- make sure everyone knows yeah. for uh, a for a raging nerd i must be one of the world's least canon bothered and like the canon serves the story exclusively if the story breaks the canon that's not my problem <laughs> uh well awesome um uh thank you for joining us on 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 camera this time you're often with us if not in spirit, if just then literally in in the chat. Yeah, I feel like the pitcher sort of hurt their arm and I got called off the stands onto the field here. So <laughs> I thank you so much for building this community and I look forward to joining everybody else in the chat next week. Yeah, awesome. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. We are going to find someone to raid. Um, not many people who I follow are on right now and I gotta get going to bed. So I think we're gonna raid the turtle channel, Turtles and Chill. Yay. It's turtles. It's chill. It's a good way to end your night if that's where you want to wind down. Um, yeah. So thank you, everybody. I will see everybody on uh, Sunday. Am I streaming this Sunday? Sunday when I'll be coming back from camping and therefore a bunch of, have a bunch of dirt and water <laughs> samples for the microscope. I'm very excited. Hopefully there'll be something fun. Okay. Stick around for the raid. Otherwise, I will see everyone later. Uh, thank you, Benjamin, again. Bye. Thanks.